We're doing a podcast. Oh, okay. I don't want you. No, no, it's okay. No, I always have time for you. I just don't want you to be recorded, whatever we're going to talk about. (laughs) I'm Colin Burroughs, and this is the Woodstein Media Podcast, Episode 6. This podcast and Woodstein Media are produced on the lands of the Mississauga, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Anishinaabe, and Odawa peoples. This episode features a conversation with Andrea Chere, Executive Director of It Takes a Village in Listowel, Ontario. It Takes a Village is a people-oriented, money-free shop and social initiative offering community members support with food security, access to resources, and assistance navigating systems such as court appointments, housing, and government support with a focus on being a welcoming and inclusive place to belong. It's a busy place, and I thank Andrea for taking the time to talk. As far as music in this episode goes, I am opening it up with a cover of Billy Bragg's Not Everything That Counts Can Be Counted by Megan McGarry. It's available on the Declare and Protest compilation released by the Subsounds Music Collective. For more information, visit subsoundsdc.bandcamp.com. This podcast and Woodstein Media are independently produced journalism that you can support by becoming a patron at Patreon or by donating through PayPal at woodstein.ca. That's W-O-O-D hyphen S-T-E-I-N dot C-A. Thanks for your interest and support. If you enjoy this podcast, you can support it by listening to more episodes on most streaming platforms. And please feel free to like them, share them, subscribe, or review them. Thanks for listening. If we could have our cake and eat it Though that's impossible to do But too many have invested in this outcome They simply can't afford for it not to come true We ceded too much power to the market Let it decide what's right or wrong Everyone seems willing to lend credence And truth is so devalued It's going for a song Not everything that counts can be counted Who holds the markets to account Not everything that counts can be counted Not everything that can be counted People have had enough of experts And their inconvenient facts Here's what the media really won't tell you Exactly who it is that's taking control back All opinions are equal In the free market of ideas And truth is nothing more than an opinion That's garnered the most likes Provoked the loudest cheers Not everything that counts can be counted Who holds the market to account Not everything that counts can be counted Not everything that can be counted There isn't really any room for dreamers If you have principles, that's nice The market isn't interested in values Except for those it can define as price I'll bow to the power of the market Till it throws up a different face If you're not white or male or compliant This system is designed to keep you in your place Not everything that counts can be counted
dictator Who holds the market to account Not everything that counts can be counted Not everything that can be counted counts Not everything that counts can be counted Who holds the market to account not everything that counts can be counted Not everything that can be counted counts Not everything that can be counted counts I want you to start at the beginning What motivated you to start it in the first place? Sure. So I am not, um, I wasn't born and raised in this area. I was, um, grew up, uh, sort of around Kitchener Waterloo and met someone and we moved out here to raise a family who's from here. And so being in Kitchener Waterloo, there, there were just so many more resources. The diversity was much more evident. Well, it was a beautiful melting pot of all different kinds of folks. And, um, and at the time I, uh, lived in a, a co-op off of the campus of, um, University of Waterloo and it was a very progressive, forward-thinking, welcoming kind of place. And, and I moved out here and I felt like, you know, if I would create an image so you could understand what I felt like, I felt like when the Roadrunner on cartoons is like his feet are turning and then all of a sudden he skids to a stop, that's what I felt like when I came out here. It just kind of blew my mind because it was, um, and it was relatively unspoken, so it was really an interpretation on my part, but it was as though there was this magical imaginary fence around Listowel and nothing, no social concerns, no different sexual orientations, no diversity, no ethnicity seemed to permeate that fence. And it, and it kind of blew my mind. So one day I was walking with my kids and they were all little and it was one of those times as a parent when, you know, you're just grateful you get out of the house unscathed. And I saw this woman and she was walking and she had on a backpack, you know, and, and it was a well-worn backpack and it was just just looks so heavy and I remember kind of looking at her and thinking to myself wow that looks like you know what I had seen in Kitchener and folks who were uh living um transiently and and sort of had all their all their most valuable possessions in their backpack because folks carry that stuff with them all the time and I was so intrigued by her I was I was actually I would say I was blown away to see her here in this community anyway I, I was out again another time again with my kids and I saw the same uh, young woman and this time she didn't have her backpack but she was in the company of a young girl and they looked just like cookie cutters these two just identical and uh, I happened to see her and again I was intrigued by her and, and I was kind of watching and it, it was one of those moments as a parent again where I just felt like I wasn't you know being my best parent that I could be so as I watched her with this young girl I, I felt to myself you know man I, I want to be more of a parent like her and I thought the next time I see her I'm, I'm going to thank her for sort of giving me that example of what really matters because this woman was hanging off every word this kid said and they were giggling and it was just such a beautiful thing to see and here I was with my little flock feeling like you know I had just epically failed in just um, being a parent that day so anyway third time I saw her she was uh, cycling by me on the main street here in Listowel and I, I realized it was her and I and I stopped her and I said oh hey uh, hey can I talk to you and she got off her bike and looked back at me and she said me and I said yeah I, I, I know we don't know each other but I said you know I, I saw you uh, this one day with this young girl and, and I said you know you were it was such a beautiful thing to watch as a mom and it was one of those times when I really wasn't feeling great uh, in my own parenting and I thought to myself that I wish that I could be more like you and uh, and I told myself that the next time I saw you I really wanted to make a point to thank you for for that and um and she started to cry and my first reaction was oh my gosh I think I just shoved my foot in my mouth and I've offended her and um she said she proceeded to say she didn't know if I understood how much that meant to her to hear that and she went on to explain her story and she said that she was um navigating substance dependency and her kids lived with her mom and she was trying her best to get well and also to save first and last month's rent for an apartment so they could all be together again but she was really struggling at that time and I was so in awe of her story because first of all I was 
incredibly honored and humbled that that she would share that story but also i was just so in awe of what it must take inside of her or what it must have have taken inside of her to get up and try to exist or try to be included in a community that for all intents and purposes um, acted like she didn't exist and when i walked away from talking with her that day I knew that we had to create something within this community because the services within the community that had been here long standing were not meeting the needs of people like her who were navigating very human experiences that we see all over. When the village started though, it did not have the same scope that it has taken. No, on. so when I when I saw her and the reason why she was so impactful in the starting of the village was because and I see her face often but she really demonstrated to me the need for the community to grow together, to organize within themselves and find ways within the community to help each other and support each other um, and to include each other so that everyone could try to live their best life possible. So that was my interaction with her was probably, I would say, maybe five or seven years before the village actually came into fruition. So I had kind of sat on that and kicked that around for our several years and then one year I just thought what am I waiting for so I thought kids are going back to school and it was in the it was in August I believe or July that I thought I'm just going to post all over social media and see if anyone would be interested in trying to create a model even if it's just for the month of August so before kids go back to school uh, just create a model where people donate things people can take those things without money being exchanged and just help everyone to sort of overcome that incredible expense that is you know the back to school expense so there was quite a bit of interest on social media to get it going and there was another woman her name is Janie Pave her and I sort of co-founded that first experience so we did it for a month we were given um, free rent pounded the pavement looking for places that were available that might consider renting um, giving us free rent for a month we did find someone Mr. Tanner here in town he gave us uh, a place for a month and we tried it and it was completely astounding the amount of people who reached out to donate and the amount of people who came to get the resources that the village was providing which was food and also everything that you would need in your everyday life from those humble beginnings the village now it has a lot more going on than just free store model there's community groups who you've been in touch with who facilitate with people who need their services through the village so can you talk more about how that came about like how the village grew from that first idea to what it is now I felt like it was almost like people were waiting for an opportunity to come so that they could both begin to care about each other, but also be able to live the truth of their stories in a community and not have to hide away in the darkness of those things. And by that, I mean the very human things that we as imperfect people navigate, mental illness, uh, substance dependency, food insecurity, poverty, all those things. So when we started it for that month, it really brought so many of those issues to the forefront. More so, not just the issues, the issues were there and existing as they have been since the dawn of time with humanity, but the lack of appropriate service for a lot of those things and the lack of awareness of those things in these rural communities. So sometimes, you know, you, you might find you have an organization that has been within a community for decades, but uh, perhaps is not evolving as the community is evolving and their scope of service is not not what it needs to be to reflect that. So when the village came and we put these things together, it was also an organic way to connect with people, right? To be able to have a place where people can come. There's no judgment. They just come. They feel welcome. They feel invested because it really is their place and it's a community initiative. So that, you know, created an environment where people seem to feel relaxed and free to talk about some of the things that they were navigating based off of that. So, so that one month was just a trial, you know, essentially a pipe dream to see if we could do it and how the community would receive it. And then when it closed down, it at the end of the month, after Mr. Tanner had given us a month, I knew in my heart that it needed to go on because there needed to be changes within the community, within the county, and that was the catalyst. So to stop it from there just seemed like not an option. So from there, a few months later, we're able to find uh, a, another place to rent. Um, you know, at that time, we barely had 
the first month's rent. We barely knew if we were going to get any more money or where it would come from. When was that? That was in uh, 2017. So uh, we did find a place. People continu continued to donate. So from there, we've evolved to a bigger space. We have programs that we run, diversion programs through the court where people come here and work their community service hours. We have um, organizations that help people with community withdrawal or substance management, substance dependency management come in. We connect with a lot of different resources like that in a place that is where people are comfortable and feel free to come. So we really have grown quite a bit and 100% it's the community that has grown it and the volunteer team. We have over 30 volunteers here. So it's a pretty amazing ride. On that, working with other community organizations, first of all, I, I sometimes hear that the village kind of works against some of those, but that hasn't really been what I've seen. The number one being uh, Salvation Army, but I've seen you direct people towards the Salvation Army. What do you say to people who are, who say you're working against some of the others? Yeah, and I hear that too. And I've really had to personally, had to develop a, a thick skin to that um, because in communities, so essentially, you know, people will say um, there's not a monopoly on poverty money. I 100% believe there is. It's very much like a business, how you run your business, uh, the money you spend on your advertising campaigns and those kinds of things, the top heavy um, bureaucratic structure of your organization. You know, a lot of the money that's out there to assist people with issues that they're going through goes to a lot of those things in my humble opinion. So when you have a grassroots organization that you just start up out of the dirt and you engage people and you consistently create a platform for people to tell their own stories as opposed to having someone else tell someone what is best for them, you're going to rock boats. And it's unfortunate because on the ground level, it takes a village I don't feel has any issues with any of the organizations that we connect with or the people we work with. I, I have to believe that some of those um, things that are being said are coming from people in positions that potentially feel, first of all, concerned because there's now another place that has to share in the funding that's being allotted. But second of all, and it wasn't our intention, but it did bring to light a lot of gaps that have been here longstanding, even though organizations have been in the area. So the reality is everyone, I believe, to the best of their intentions, does good work. But we have to ask ourselves, is that work reflecting the evolving needs within our community? And I feel the answer has been no. So, you know, to bring light and say, OK, well, you know, people are saying they need this. People are saying they go away to incarceration, they come back, there's nothing here for them to support them. How can we ask people to be successful when we just refuse to even have a conversation of what they need out here to be able to be successful in these communities? And it's interesting because there's also the pushback of, you know, an organization like The Village is bringing these issues to the community because we had the courage to bring light to the issues that were happening. The reality is folks want to stay in the communities where they're familiar, where their people are that they love. So as it sits, and it's getting a little better marginally, but as it sits, people have to leave the area to get help and to get treatment and to get things that will help them be stronger and essentially make a stronger community. So, you know, all of the, the negative comments and the things that are said, and there's a lot out there, you have to be a strong person to navigate uh, creating something like this independently but I believe a lot of that negativity comes from just being you know the new kid on the block and and saying no you know this this isn't okay if we really want to encourage people and, and have them know they're supported we need to listen to them they need to be at the table to have discussions about what they need and then we look at it and say okay how can we assist with what these folks are saying they need in that you were saying some things that i know sometimes people will be directed here by services in town because you can you don't have as much bureaucracy you have a board you have things you have to do but sometimes you can just help people faster than if they go to certain services. That That's not to say you can provide everything that other services do, but um, mm -hmm. sometimes 
fill in that gap. Mm -hmm. is... So, you know, life through our lens here is far more gray than it is black and white. People, humanity, it's a gray area. So to, you know, just sort of reference what you're saying, it is true. We can do things here that are things that it's not one size fit all. And I'll, and I'll just share with you earlier, just within the last few days, someone reached out and, and this person is a community member, long standing community member, long standing struggle with substance dependency, uh, homelessness, you know, many issues that, that they faced in, in their journey. And they recently got out of incarceration and they came into the village. They said like, I'm scared because I don't know what to do here. I, everything is so familiar. Everyone I knew is using. I just feel like I have to start again and I don't know what to do. So, you know, that person today reached out to me and said, I can have a bed at a rehab center. The bed is available. They'll keep it for me, but I don't have any gas to get there. So, you know, the community so generously donates gift cards and things to us here. And, you know, I said to her, if I can be sure that that's where you're going, you know, we can give you these gift cards for gas. And, you know, and that's how we do it. And, and I have profound gratitude to the community for having faith in in us to distribute those things and to support people in that regard because that's what it's about and sometimes I think we tie our names to certain brands and and those are brands of social agencies or whatever the case may be uh you know we're pushed to get charitable status because that somehow denotes more transparency and authenticity but then we have to ask ourselves how much is that going to limit our ability to do the work that we do and and I feel that it it will limit our work to some degree and I, and I you know I, I feel concerned in that regard okay in that because we've been talking about issues that the community brings up but also you have a lot of community support do you want to talk about that side the the supportive part of the community here in North mm -hmm. Perth yeah, it's interesting. I got a phone call recently from a person there. Um, they donated money to us. It was an employee team. And one of the people on the team called, and I assumed that they were calling to share when they were going to bring their donation. And they had uh, previously told us about the donation. It was over the holidays. And I thought that they were calling to say when they were coming. And this person said, you know, I just, I wondered if I could talk to you for a sec. And I said, of course. And they said, I, I want to tell you something. And it's kind of a little bit, I'm sure it's going to sound crazy, but just hear me out. I love those kinds of moments. And so they said, I want to ask you never to shut the village down. And I said, okay. And they said, because I hear so many things. Do you know that they call you the homelessness, help, the homeless helper? And I kind of giggled and he said, but it's never said in a positive way. And he said, it's frustrating to me, all the misconceptions that go around about the work that you do there, because what would happen if the village ceased to exist? And so in that conversation, I put it back to him and thanked him for his support. And I mean, even though they were also making financial donation, the fact that this person had enough compassion for the community and enough care for the community to reach out and say, look, I'm hearing all the stuff that's going on. Don't quit. Okay. To me, that is what keeps the wind in the sails. So we have so many folks who will come out, they'll stop in, they'll donate gift cards or bus passes, or they'll come in and bring produce and bring food and all those kinds of things. And I would say probably a good 75 or 80% of those people will say, I have a family member who struggled with mental illness and they had to leave our community because there was nothing here for them. And it was such a hard community for them to be able to exist in and live in once their issues became uh, visible. And so those people will come in or someone will come in and say, hey, you know what, like years ago, I was struggling with substance dependency or I didn't know where my next meal was coming from and I just want to pay it back now. So the support that we have, we have some wonderful corporate um, support on a consistent basis, which is amazing. It's kind of like your big brother throwing an arm around your shoulder saying, you know, we're here for you. But the people that come in and have those stories and who intentionally say, I want to give it to the village because I've been there myself. 
that kind of support is profoundly moving because you really, really know that you are doing the work that people want you to do. It's not comfortable for people to talk about. It's not comfortable for people to acknowledge that this is what goes on in a community. But the reality is, what kind of a community are we if we cannot hold space and honor the path that someone else is going on? And the biggest thing we say here in terms of talking about support and talking about real life is this is not how the story ends. So where someone is in this moment, you know, we see it when people come in and they donate because they have been here before. That is what we hope for, for people. We hope that they will stay with us another day. We hope that a mental illness will not um, take such control that, that ending a life seems like the solution to everything else. We hope that st substance dependency, that it's not going to be an overdose because that's not how the story is supposed to end for that person. And so we just continue to have this hope when, when these people come in and offer their support, you know, everything about the village is existing. Our physical structure, our rent, our overhead, all of that, um, our food donations, all possible because people believe in something and what they're believing in is other people it's profoundly moving in that when you were talking about this person saying that you're known as the homeless helper and i've heard that the thing is we know you're not you people have said the village brings homeless people here most of the people who are homeless here have lived here longer than the village has been here mm -hmm. so the thing is these problems that are causing these issues are not being caused by the village. So you're helping to do something about a problem that was already here. But do you ever get frustrated that the bigger root causes of these issues are not getting the focus they need or things are getting worse? Like, I mean, the cost of housing is out of control still, even though people have said to me, you know, it, it's kind of leveled out or it's leveled out a uh, price that people can't afford. Yeah. Do you ever feel like you're putting a Band-Aid on a severed limb or something? Yeah, it's on a consistent basis. And, um, you know, in the last couple of years, we've done well between our coverage in, in the newspaper and our bus tour campaign, you know, we've tried really to bring some of those people in positions of power for uh, leadership to these issues that are going on in these communities. So, you know, we'll flip on CBC TV to watch a program and you'll see a commercial from the federal government talking about the epidemic of opioid use and the amount of people that are dying from overdoses. And and that's advertised by the federal government on a, you know, mainstream um, TV station. Yet in our own communities, you know, we have difficulty to honestly and authentically acknowledge people are struggling with those things. It would be great if morality didn't enter the conversation with a lot of these concerns, but it really does, right? You're struggling with these concerns, you know, and, and you are a bad person because you are struggling with those things. And, and one of the things that really inspires me the most and also hurts me the most as well on the, the other side of the coin is the amount of people who have family members, who have loved ones, who personally have had these experiences and who have had to sit in shame and sit in darkness to navigate this stuff. So, you know, if you love someone who has done a crime or very publicly has, has struggled with uh, mental illness or very publicly has struggled with substance dependency, if you love that person, that's somehow not acceptable in the eyes of some people. So we raise our children, you know, and we, and we you know, look at our children with the most hope and the, you know, beautiful uh, things that we, that we want for them. We're so protective of them. But when they reach a point when they're struggling and that's visible, then it's, you know, it's no longer acceptable to love that person where they, they are. So when I look at some of the things where, you know, people will say things like the homeless helper or whatever the case may be, I think to myself, these are your people. These are your people that we are wanting to show them, that we see them, that we care for them, that we want them to be okay wherever they are in that moment. Just 
just be okay. Just be here tomorrow. You know, so I, I find it's, um, it's a relatively uh, painful and, and hypocritical thing to sit back and observe when, you know, in other areas, and as I said, you know, the federal government itself is, is um, putting so much money into programs on broader levels to assist people. But here in our community, it's not even a conversation we can have. That needs to come from leadership, in my opinion. We need to have leaders who understand the honor of being elected into those positions and, and they need to have the courage to have these conversations and help people to understand that these struggles are human and that they need to be supported and the resources need to come to these communities. Especially when you were talking about substance dependency there, that's one place where that is really apparent. In my own life, I've had several conversations recently with people who were talking about junkies or crackheads or meth heads in town and it's all really negative and dehumanizing the way that they talk about people a lot of it comes with assumption that people are using there's so many other issues that people could have mental health issues of physical health issues that make seem chronic diseases that make people look like they could be using i am profoundly impacted when I see someone who is incredibly misunderstood. Their health is misunderstood. You know, there's all these assumptions about that person. And I think to myself, first of all, my heart feels pain for that individual. Secondary to that, my heart feels pain for anyone else who is going to come behind that person in life who is ever going to struggle. Because when we talk about creating awareness, Bell Let's Talk Day is coming up. We talk about creating awareness for mental health, mental illness, um, different things like that. And I think to myself, that is several steps down the river, those kinds of things. Because if we don't have the courage to look at why people are falling in in the river in the first place and why they are afraid to acknowledge that they're struggling or acknowledge their mental health is not good, then we really have to take a couple steps back and start there. So you can have communities where people sort of... In a, and I mean this not in, in a disrespectful way, but people rally around certain campaigns and things like that. And I really shudder for those people who are hiding away, going through whatever it is that others are celebrating, because that sort of performance allyship where we say, yes, we support this. Yes, we promote this. You know, leadership says that. But then when it comes right down to it, we have to ask ourselves, well, do they? You know, is that really what we're doing here? Because if we're not, we need to take a look at that fundamental. Mentally. We talk about inclusivity and strong communities, but we have to ask ourselves, what sort of courageous leadership do we have in saying, you know what, I see you. I have been blessed to, you know, be present with so many people on their journeys in life. And I have learned so much about myself and about people. But I remember this one gentleman and he was really struggling with what I understood from him and his family members was uh, mental health. And at one point he was having a bit of a crisis in the village and um, I had gotten everyone else out of the store. It was just him and I, and I was uh, trying to find a way to get him to the hospital. But anyway, at one point when he was really in crisis, he said to me quite loud and quite aggressively, you don't see me. And I said, but I do see you. And he looked at me and he stopped and he said, you do. And I said, I do. And he said, are you sure you do see me? And I said, I see you. And I just thought to myself, when he said that, I thought, that's what it's like when you are struggling and you are trying to get by and, you know, you just morph into, you know, this fabric where, where you hide away and nobody sees you. And that's what it feels like, right? And I think to myself, how horrific it is to try to be strong or be well or seek resources or get help or just get through the day when people don't see you. I've seen you. Yeah, so, and the other thing too that is important to consider, and it's interesting when we talk about, and again, I'll reference that homeless helper thing, when you are in a community organization, it's a it's a stream of social work that's really important, right? And it, and it is having that ability to help a community see what the strengths are within the community, what the resources are, how they can address some of those things from the bottom up or the ground up as opposed to the top down. And part of that, a huge part of that is 
being flexible and, and being able to evolve as an organization. So homelessness, it's interesting. And I, you know, I'm not going to lie, I kind of giggle about it sometimes, about how many people focus on that being the biggest issue here in our community. That was an issue that was much bigger in the past, in the last couple of years. You know, a lot of work was brought to, to folks who were navigating homelessness or precarious housing to show, you know, this is the human face of what is happening here. And it has been addressed to the point where there's far less people navigating that now. So then what do you do as a community-based organization? You say, okay, so what is the next thing? What do we see next? So for us, you know, we see restorative justice is something that um, it really has to be present within the community and within the county because people are getting angry at the amount of property thefts and they, you know, that translates to OPP, who is our policing force within this community, translates into the court system, to the justice system, you know, and, and when the reality is people need to be able to share the impact of someone's actions on someone else. Do you want to give a brief description of what restorative justice is? Sure. So from my lens, restorative justice, what I would focus on in this area, restorative justice has many different offshoots of the originating principles, but essentially what I talk about is the victim offender reconciliation. So in many things within our community, if you look up social media, you'll see it. There'll be a property crime, a theft or something like that. Before you know it, the names are being shot out on social media, who did it? And, you know, people will say, well, it does doesn't matter you can just do that because there's no repercussions anyway there's a great loss of faith right and and it's also um you know once someone does those things and the property crimes are committed or whatever the case may be how do they move on with their life in a community that you know it's hard to get a job it's hard to do anything and so the model that that i would like to see happen is where we bring the victim and the offender and their supports supports for the victim supports for the offender um together in in a supported environment where people are able to understand you know what was done and how that impacted someone right you go into someone's garage and steal all their tools for their job or whatever the case may be or steal their child's bicycle or whatever you know you're really impacting people Right. And, and so people, you know, that ability to, to connect together and, and you don't have to come to terms on it's not a matter of evaluating someone's feelings, but it's about being able to articulate how you felt and what the circumstances were and that kind of thing. And I have to believe that is a model that has to happen in communities because we need to be able to show people that they can find some solutions together. Right now, that's primarily a penal system based solution when the reality is we can do more to guide people in supportive ways to, to reconcile things or feel vet better and feel more invested about things. So, so, you know, homelessness is still an issue. It is going to be an issue long after I walk on this earth, long after you walk on this earth, but what else? So that's being addressed. There's more resources coming about. The dialogue is being created. What's next? Restorative justice is an important one. I also would like to see an opportunity for people who have gone through different concerns that they have struggled with to be able to be employed in supportive environments that are familiar with people who might have uh, some struggles outside the gates, you know, so getting to places on time, being um, responsible, you know, different things where people can develop skills. So like a cafe where people, you know, work in this cafe one day a week. And from that, they're learning, by example, food safety skills. They're learning how to relate to the community. They're learning how to be dependable, how to, how to come across conflict resolution, those kinds of things. Because oftentimes what I hear from people when they go away for rehab or incarceration or um, different things that take people out of the community, they come back and as we touched on, they say there's nothing out here for us. So we have so many opportunities to strengthen our communities and to help people live their best life and to create equity and social justice. We just need to be willing to have the courage to have those conversations and also have the courage and the humility to understand that if we haven't walked those paths, we maybe don't have all the answers. There's just something I'm thinking of. It may not take the form of a question, but it goes back to substance use and the morality that you brought up earlier. Because I'm thinking about overdoses and how a lot of the time it's just that the drugs are adulterated. They're, they're not clean. We just talk about it like drug users, they're bad. We shouldn't be trying to help them do what they're doing. But some people, because they have other issues that we're not solving for them. We're not making 
certain social issues any better so people are using drugs as a result. So what I'm thinking about right now is other options like a clean supply. I know there's a group working in Waterloo Region trying to push ideas like that. Is there talk that you've heard of here? Have, have people brought up more than just being able to get clean gear or whatever? Mm -hmm. uh, like I know that's available and that's good. Yeah, so anecdotally, I have heard people talk about uh, clean injection sites and places where you can go and test your drugs and, and even the kits, making the kits accessible where you can test your drugs as well. I personally have not heard those conversations from organizations or people in places of leadership. And, and it's not, I don't think that I'm not hearing it because people are not wanting it or not thinking of it. I honestly feel that breaking ground in those areas in these communities is really 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 difficult to do and when we talk about the morality component of it you know families uh, like we touched on you know you, you have your people and you love your people sometimes you know your people break your heart and you have to create these boundaries and and make some degrees of separation so that you can be okay as well and i think we don't stress that enough to people that those boundaries that someone has to make when their person is struggling with with some of those things and i realize i'm getting off topic but you know we need to be able to support people in that as well in making those boundaries and then on the on the flip side those of us in leadership or in positions of you know providing resources and educating the community have to not give up the fight to have those things come into these communities because things are not going away and the, and the simple fact of not talking about them or being afraid of them that's not going to make a problem go away being able to talk about it and so that that you know there is an organization here in the community that has supported housing. And, you know, I remember when that started to come about, you know, there was so much opposition to that, what it would bring to the community, you know, that sort of thing. We have um, brought light to the homelessness issue and, and now we are, you know, strapped with that issue of how we're bringing homelessness to town. We talk about clean injection sites and, and um, resources for people to be safe and be healthy while they navigate things. And again, you know, that's a really big, a really big thing where I feel it's going to be derogatory in the sense that that's going to bring the drugs to town in establishing one of those. And I know I just got off the topic because as I was talking to you, I started to think about something else. So wait a second. I, I just want to be did you say that you believe that would bring the drugs? No, okay. no, are you kidding? No way. I, I just misunderstood no. you. No, what I, what I feel like is that that's going to be the assumption. Yeah, so, okay. So, like, and I'm just trying not to bring up names because I don't, I didn't, I don't want it to get off kilter, but for example, Choices for Change and Resilience based out of Stratford or Seaforth, you know, they're doing really amazing work with with that right and those are organizations and you know the village the tanner Steffler foundation based out of here on county like these are all organizations that have the capability to have those conversations and to advocate for those things but that resistance to bring that out to these communities is so hard to move past kitchener is a very progressive huge community and if they're just breaking ground on stuff like that now that's not to say we can't keep fighting and keep advocating for those things because they are important and that's what saves lives. It's just that in these communities, you know, you just don't understand the difficulty in those things. And, and when we talk about leadership and conversations, you know, we have municipal leaders, we have church leaders, we have schools and teachers and educators. We have so many people in position of leadership. Imagine the world if we all engaged in the same forward thinking conversation. That would be incredibly powerful. But, you know, it's it's not a realistic goal, obviously. So I know I got way off with that one, sir. Okay. No, no, I think you ended up... Winding it back in. So also on a more positive look at things, we've been talking about the donations you get, but also 30 plus volunteers at any given time, because you've had a lot more than that involved since the beginning. Yep. Do you want to just talk about uh, how positive that is, that, that support? Yeah, so the village has one wage, and that's mine, for almost five of the six years. I did um, the village 
while I was working or attending university. So it's only been in the last year and change that we have paid a wage. So every single person that comes here, comes here and wants to be involved because they want to make the world a better place. And that is profoundly moving. So when you look at the 30 people or so that are involved, that is people who pick up food bring it here from the partnerships we have with grocery stores for food rescues. That's people who go to Stratford and pick up the monthly pet supplies for people to care for their pets um, because that, that food and, the, and those supplies are very expensive. So when you look at the grand scheme of all of the things that we do, you know, there's so many people who come here, they just show up for each other. And that's, that's a profoundly moving thing. And, um, you know, it's, I feel so protective of the volunteers too, because they come and they do this amazing work and they're, they're just such, you know, lovely, gorgeous people. And, and I want them to be celebrated for that because they have the faith in the village. They have the faith in what it does. They see it on a consistent basis because they connect with people on a consistent basis, right? Sometimes I just want our leadership to recognize the smaller organizations and the people who come out and do the work they do because that is what strengthens our community. So it's it's a pretty amazing, amazing journey to watch these people. And, and when we were talking about um, being tagged with supporting people in homelessness and stuff like that. There are um, organizations or businesses in the area that will pay their employee a day's wage for that employee to come out and volunteer somewhere. So we've had a couple of those folks come here and the one in particular landed right in, longtime community member, landed right in when, when she came and did her shift. She was assisting, there was a gentleman from a hamlet not too far from here. He had come here, he needed a tent, he needed some food and that kind of stuff to go back to that hamlet. She assisted people in the community who come in for food where English is not their first language, so we need to connect with Google Translate or whatever. You know, so all of these different things where this person just was, you know, just jumped right in to the, to the, um, the day at the village. And afterwards, you know, before she left and we sort of uh, debriefed and she said, I had no clue. No clue. She said, I, I just feel so good about being here today and I feel so good for connecting with people and I really want to come back. You know, that's the beauty of people who are invested in something on a consistent basis because that's where the strength in our community comes from and that's where people are going to find solutions to the problems that their neighbors and their family members and their loved ones are, are navigating, right? You hit on something there about the amount of help that you give to new Canadians as North Perth becomes a much more diverse community. You have a lot of people speaking other languages coming in. Is there work that you've been doing surrounding that? Yeah, so again, you know, I, I can't stress it enough, the need for organizations to evolve with the, the needs of the community. And so we have had, you know, at one point, and it was, a, for me, it was a, a beautiful moment as much as it was a moment of you know, such, I, I believe, shock is probably the word I would say. But at one point I was in the front, it was a very busy day and I looked up and there there were all of these different faces from all of these different, you know, um, ethnicities, different, this global um, patronage on that particular day. And I, and I remember looking up thinking, wow, like, wow, it was beautiful, but it was always like, we need to evolve to be able to understand what the needs are that these folks, so whether there is an incentive for businesses to bring people to the community to employ or whatever the case may be, but, um, you know, that, that, um, demographic within our community of people who are coming from other countries to be able to start a new life here is really it is expanding so i did have uh, someone reach out from an organization that helps people resettle and it was such an, a beautiful talk she shared with me that they do have people coming here for employment to this area first of all they have to come up with quite a substantial amount of money to be able to come to the country oftentimes they're having to borrow money so they have now this loan with uh, incredibly unreasonable interest rates that they have to pay people back to be able to get that money to be able to come here and then they come here oftentimes the jobs are minimum wage jobs you know they have to pay rent to be here as well and and they have to repay their loan plus they have to get their groceries and everything else we would need to survive she said I've heard about the village and I want to be able to bring people there but they are embarrassed they feel a little bit of a sense of shame because they've come here and now they're gonna have to you know so we were really strategizing 
organizing on ways that we can create, you know, support and empowerment and dignity, which is what the village is trying to be about for, for folks to be able to come here and be included, not just come here and access the services, but be part of, of the village, be part of the team, educate us on what we need to do. So um, just recently, we've put a call out on our page for um, our goal is whether we can uh, reach it or not, 30 bags of basmati rice and, and 30 bags of lentils. Um, because this is, um, you know, the, the diet that these folks would mainly exist on. And then that is, again, an educational piece for us because I see what our food bank is lacking. So, you know, for here, most food banks don't have a high quantity of halal things, don't have a lot of things that uh, people with uh, different ethnicities would have in their diversity of their kitchens, right? So that's another way that we're trying to be able to assist the community in that regard. So it's always about evolving. What is the need? Okay, so this we've kind of, you know, we've set some bones in place for this. We've gotten this rolling. What do we need to look at now? So when I see these folks who have the courage and the determination to come here to want for a better life and they come and, and you know, they're trying their best, I am in awe of that. And we need to, as a community, we talk about welcoming people. We talk about inclusivity. But is that the case? Because sometimes we'll chat with people and they are afraid to be in the community. They feel that bias. They feel that racism. They feel those things. And then on top of that, they're nervous to reach out to organizations that can support them. You know, the embarrassment of having to ask for help. Conversations I hear around town about certain areas of the town, like in the South End, there, there's some nicknames. It's just awful. Mm -hmm. And you can tell the, the people saying them, they grew up here, they don't have much experience outside of here, and they're not really experiencing what new people have to offer. They're kind of limiting. They're living in a smaller part of Listowel than they used to because they won't participate with new people. It's weird and strange and sad mm -hmm. to me. So. Well, we had a market in um, the summer. We did our first um, community access market in the summer. And one of the goals of the market was to create a more of a sense of community for people who are being discriminated against, you know, for whatever reason. And so we had many people come out and tell us about their experiences of coming here, actually. Some of it, I have to admit, you, you feel very emotional. Like, you feel like... Um, you know, you, you want people to be included and be protected and, and not have to face that kind of stuff, you know, in this, in this day and age and, and that kind of thing. And, and, on, and, the, and then you learn about the wealth of, of their knowledge, their journey, you know, what things were like, what prompted them to come here, you know, what was scary, what was amazing, you know, how do you cook this particular vegetable, you know, the, those kinds of things. And it's an exciting melting pot of um, getting to know each other. But again, you know, that has to be modeled on all levels of leadership within a community. Yeah, it's, um, it's a beautiful thing. And I, I just feel so much gratitude for the opportunity to be in this journey of the village because it's just as beautiful as you're gonna make it. That's the reality of life. I'll ask you if uh, there's anything you would want in there that we haven't talked about yet. I think the one thing that I would touch on is um, the amount of people who reach out to ask us at the village to mentor them on um, creating similar models within their own communities. You know, it's interesting because the village is a, for the most part, moneyless endeavor. We do ask money for things that are very high end. That money helps us to purchase things for our food bank and that sort of thing. But between that and, and our food pantry system and those kinds of things, we have so many other communities reaching out saying, can you come and help us to start this up here? Do you feel this would be a reasonable place to do this? How do we do that? And so the tide is changing where people really want to have um, grassroots organizations from the bottom up that do impact change. And I feel, you know, sometimes I just really feel that people seem tired. It's, it's tedious to continue to donate to organizations where it's from the top down. And I am grateful that people feel empowered that they can impact these changes because there's huge, huge force of, you know, strength to be able to see people come together and create something that they're all invested in. 
in. And and I'm honored when people reach out and, and ask us to help them. We are not in a position yet um, from a structural um, perspective to be able to go off and do that in terms of policies and procedures and stuff like that. We don't have those bones quite honed enough to be able to go and offer that as a, you know, as a similar franchise type of an idea for someone else to get up and going. But, um, but the conversations of people who are wanting to make change is really amazing. Okay. That was one of the last things I was going to ask you because you had told me before that you had saw it as something that you hoped would start up in other communities and mm -hmm. spread like a, not a nasty virus, a good mm -hmm. virus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a non-pandemic virus. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I want to say thank you for having me because your good work consistently keeps those conversations going. The blood runs cold as the innocent is burned. The was gold city on the body seem to learn. Beyond the K like a flashlight, no side of life. Broken bones lay upon the street, no humanity in sight. Oh, shadows and horns and travel through the wind. The odds are broken down, only city has no end. The judgment day is gonna be gone like time and time again. Like a paper fracture wound, still too heavy to mend. Watch all the news and I watch the abuse that makes me sick of what about all the accused The guilty or innocent, the money's game is on But the state can murder thousands, I guess it's another flaw The pleading star from a million wage wars Never be a winner when violence only asks for more A billion must spend a thousand more deaths, a billion more spent, a thousand more deaths. Thanks for listening. The song you just heard is Blood Runs Cold by Ricky Mullen. A musician with some list wall roots, although now I believe he's based out of Cambridge, Ontario. Check the description wherever you are listening to this for links to more information. Or visit woodstein.ca. That's W-O-O-D hyphen S-T-E-I-N dot C-A. You can support this podcast by becoming a patron at Patreon dot com slash Colin Burroughs. Like, share, comment, follow, and support Woodstein Media and this podcast, and have a wonderful day. Thank <laughs> you.